most, if I'm seeing an athlete, they always complete the mood profile just before the meeting. Uh, I score it and we discuss their current emotional state uh, during any, any time I'm talking to them. And it becomes very quickly obvious from their profile whether something is bothering them or whether they're tra traveling quite well. I've noticed without that, often the discussion goes on and you never really get to the issue that is bothering you. So these are other methods. Um, we published a number of papers. This paper clearly shows that we can predict injury risk from, um, from these profiles. This was with a large cohort of, uh, of athletes, elite athletes at the Queensland Academy of Sport. There were over there were 845 of them. And this was part of a regular screening. And that's what I recommend, that this becomes part of regular screening of athletes. We, um, it's used in South Africa. Um, it's been used with their combat troops to screen for post-traumatic stress disorder and, uh, or, or risk. So it's not, it's not a diagnostic criterion on its own, but it, it screens for risk of psychopathology, including PTSD. Um, one good thing about it is it's online and it's free. Um, and there's the, uh, there's the, uh, the web address there. And, um, Anybody is, uh, is free to use it. Um, so, you know, any of your students, any of your staff, any of your athletes, coaches, so on, can, can use it. This one, of course, is in English. I would like to see uh, a Portuguese version of this, and that, would be, that could be a, a future project to create that. But the way it works is you fill out the, the questions online, and it automatically gives you, instantly gives you your profile. Uh, you'll recognize this, of course as the iceberg profile, and it gives you a report instantly generated, which essentially says you're good to go. This one, in fact, is an Everest profile. Um, and so you know, it's checking in like this, takes a couple of minutes and says, yeah, you're, you're all good. However, not, people are not always all good. Um, and this uh, shows a very negative profile. And the, so you get the, excuse me, um, you get a, a little report uh, on each of the dimensions. So tension here is in the red zone. Um, and it, it, it talks a little bit more about that, but then gives you some strategies which are evidence-based, which have shown to be ways to reduce tension, for example. Um, and this is important, I'd suggest, because if people have this negative profile, it's like, well, thanks for telling me, what do I do about it? So we give them um, some things they can do. And you see on the depression side, because depression, you know, can lead to suicide ideation, we can't ignore high depression scores. So at the bottom there, um, we give them um, a link to what uh, some of the, um, some of the crisis intervention uh, um, organizations so it, for example we lifeline is what we call here so we suggest that because your depression scores are so high you might want to think about contacting lifeline um, this was the paper we published in 2017 where I where we identified these new mood profiles and you, we had three large samples and the profiles were identical in each of those samples so you can see the ones I spoke about earlier the red one is the inverse Everest, the yellow one is the inverse iceberg, the, uh, the green one, the light green one is the iceberg, uh, the purple one is the surface, the blue one is the shark fin, and the olive one is the submerged. So because these have been so easy to replicate in different samples, we believe there's a, a lot of new research that needs to be conducted to find out some of the things that cause these, some of the things you can do to change them, and also what effects they're likely to have on both our everyday functioning, our training uh, responses, and our performance. So we have started to do cross-cultural validation of these. This is in the, an Italian data set. On the left is a data set of about 1,000 compared to ours, and you can see there's some small deviations, but essentially, the six profiles are identical in, um, in that uh, 
in that culture as well as in the one we started with. So the future research around this, I think, would be, for example, to see whether these profiles are evident in a Brazilian context. I'm sure they will be, but we need to demonstrate that. Uh, it would also help in doing this to continue uh, strengthen the validation process for the for the Brazilian mood scale, but we want to know what uh, what effects um, on on outcomes and what what are the what we call the antecedents of these uh, five profiles would be. So as you see, let's get let's collaborate. Vamos colaborar. So um, so I think that we we would hopefully um, be able to find something useful. Uh, which could involve students, could involve people doing their PhDs, could involve faculty members, and so on. And there's, there's lots of potential publications there. Um, another thing I want to talk about, because I know it's such a big thing in Brazil, is music. I've just published this paper, which is one, almost my, the crowning glory of my publication career. It's been published in Psychological Bulletin, which is an incredibly difficult journal to get into. It's the, it's the top journal out of about 1,200 psychology journals. And it is a, a meta-analysis of, uh, of the effects of music in exercise and sport, which everyone knows intuitively that music has some benefits, but this is solid evidence about what they are. And in order to do this, we summarized 139 studies, um, dating back, in fact, to 1911. Uh, but there are, there are now thousands of studies on the effects of music. Um, and we found that there are four significant beneficial effects. Um, music essentially makes you feel better. Well, hallelujah, everybody knows that. Uh, but this is evidence that it's been shown scientifically. And that's the most reliable effect. But it also has a significant beneficial effect on physical performance, particularly if you're performing in time to the music. Um, and, that, and that the music is you know, obviously has lyrics that are uplifting, that the, that the tempo is, is usually between that 120 to 140 beats per minute level um, and so on. There's other things that we looked at, but the good news is that most music, regardless of its properties and whether it matches your, uh, whether it matches your activity, has some performance benefits. The third thing that we showed was Music makes you feel as though you're working less hard than you actually are objectively. That's called perceived exertion. And the benefit there is about a 5% reduction in, what you're, in, in how hard you think you're working. So that's one of the reasons why exercise to music classes re remain so popular, because people work a little harder for a little longer, because the music masks the sense of exertion. And the fourth one, and this is where the physiologists start to sit up and take note, is that we did find that if you are exercising in time to music, um, there is a, a small, about a 1% saving on oxygen consumption for doing identical amount of work with and without music. Um, and so I think that in the training sphere, you should just maximize the, um, uh, the, the training effect that you get. Using music in a, in a quite a sophisticated way can, can have benefits there. Um, Michael Phelps there below, of course, the greatest Olympian of all time, is also the, the greatest advocate for music uh, as well. And um, he listens to music you know, one, up to one minute before he performs. Um, and his music has changed a little bit over the years, but when he won his eight gold medals in, um, in Beijing, for example, he, he always listened to what's called gangster rap, um, a, an artist, American artist called Lil Wayne. And uh, it's really about, you know, don't mess with me, I'm the man, you, you can't touch me, you can't beat me. Um, and it really just uh, reinforced his sense of invincibility. And in fact, when he got back to America, after he won all those medals, he went to see Lil Wayne uh, to thank him. So uh, this, is, this is, you know, the greatest Olympian of all time saying, music is absolutely central to my performance. Now, I've pretty much finished what I wanted to tell you. I just want to give you some, um, some things that you can use for free. Uh, I, I've produced the world's first Creative Commons licensed book on, on sports psychology. It's actually here over my right shoulder. Um, and this book's called Secrets of Asian Sports Psychology. 
uh, because you know, Australia is, is in, in, an, in the Asia region. I was the president of the Asian South Pacific Association of Sports Psychology. So this was uh, part of my role there. And this links sports to countries that excel. So as you can see on that front cover there, archery in Korea. Koreans are best in the world at archery. How do they do it? Um, judo in Japan, diving in China. Um, we, so it's really the inside story written by the sports psychologists from those countries to give you some of their secrets. Now, those secrets are pretty universal and would apply equally to Latin America as they do to Asia. But it just gives you a little bit of insight into how, um, how they do it. And you can see there's the web address there. I'll just show you a couple of the chapters. Uh, these ones are the two from China about diving where they're clearly the best in the world and, and um, their gymnastics team where again, they've been setting the benchmark. Um, track cycling in Australia, we're pretty good at that. And I see archery in Korea. So again, this is a, actually an ebook um, and it has links out to YouTube, for example, to show some of the things that we're talking about rather than just describe them. So I encourage you to download that. Um, I also have developed a free online course in sports psychology called Elite Sports Sci, and that's available uh, to, uh, to join, to register for that. You can take it at your leisure. Some people take it in a weekend, other people spend weeks or months on it. Um, and at the moment we've had, how many have we had? We've had nearly 17,000 users, um, and these are the top 20 countries. Um, you can see that Brazil is there at round number 15. So there's been 283 people from Brazil have already taken this uh, course, and uh, we'd like to see that number greatly increase. And that's it from me. Obrigado.